Hi. Today we're going to cover PGP. We hope to have a key signing party at a future meeting, so we wanted to go through this at the beginner level so that everyone's up and ready to go for the party. So here we go. What is it? PGP is a system that provides powerful encryption for all your personal data. That means your records, files, databases, emails, images, video, etc., all of it. In short, you can encrypt and decrypt your files for safekeeping. You can encrypt your files for you to share with others. You can encrypt files, de sorry, decrypt files from others that they've sent to you to read. You can digitally sign your files and messages, and you can ensure that only the intended recipient can decrypt the files that you share. Some additional points. GPG is the, the one that we're going to use. It's free and open source. It's multi-platform. It has a command line, GUI, and integrated interfaces, although I'm only going to show the command line. I don't use the GUI or the integrated interfaces. I have no need for them. The Snowden papers indicate that PGP is one of the methods that actually thwarts the NSA, especially if used in conjunction with an anonymizer such as VPN or Tor. Authentication is done using human verification instead of some of the more traditional ones that are done on computers that are subjective, subject to hackers. This leaves some control in your hands. You choose who you want to authenticate and who you don't. Some people might be interested to hear that your Fifth Amendment rights might protect your PGP password. I'm not a lawyer and you should not you know, rely on this without consulting one, but uh, it, there's precedent where it has been used to protect uh, a PGP password and the data that it, that's locked by it. However, this isn't always the case, uh, especially where the, there's discovery that's already been made or in the case where a password uh, uh, where the data protected by the password isn't expected to be incriminating. So what is encryption? I don't know what most folks think encryption is if all they know is what they see in movies. That's probably not good, so we're going to clarify it. Encryption is a reversible transform. We transform data from a readable state to an unreadable state with the intention of transforming it back to its, to its original state. Uh, reverse, reversal requires possession or knowledge of a missing piece. That piece is a password. It's not really the password itself, but it's a hash that's produced from the password. The missing piece is sometimes called a trapdoor. There are many algorithms available for encryption, so never roll your own. Uh, many experts have analyzed all the known algorithms over years and years, and many of them have found to be weak, even the ones that a lot of people use. Uh, chances are whatever you roll is going to be weak. So use one of the existing ones and uh, you'll be okay. The symmetric encryption can protect your data. Uh, this is the AES algorithm that you may have heard of. There are many programs that provide symmetric or AES encryption and that alone is not reason enough to use PGP. PGP has this functionality built into it partly because it needs it to do its other cool stuff, but also just as a convenience. It's not the primary reason to use it. The primary reason is to use asymmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption can share your data safely as opposed to just protect it. It's designed for your data to go back and forth with other people. And that's where it shines. Single recipient re encryption and digital signing. Uh, symmetric encryption can't do any of this. Now I mentioned a hash. So what is a hash? Any data of any length can be fed into a good hashing algorithm and the output will be practically unique. Uh, as It's a long number which represents the input. The output is always the same size and will always be the same output for the given input. So you could think of this as a digital fingerprint. If two fingerprints are identical then the input which was used to produce them is also identical. The reason this is important is two parties can compare data quickly without actually exchanging the data itself. They just compare the fingerprints. I've used the terms PGP and GPG almost interchangeably, so let's clarify that. PGP was a suite of programs written by Phil Zimmerman. He was the target of criminal investigations for several years and lived under threat of prosecution for exporting the technology overseas. He was never tried and eventually he was left alone. 
the PGP suite was acquired and is now sold commercially. I forget if there were any other exchanges over the years, but uh, it's now owned by Symantec. The PGP suite is comp compatible with the Open PGP standard. GPG is the, G the GNU Privacy Guard. It's free and it's open source and also complies with the Open PGP standard and so is therefore compatible with PGP. I'll generally refer to the technology as PGP and the program that we're using as GPG. If I slip up, you can just know that they're basically the same thing. So for GPG software, uh, first and foremost, GPG is Linux software. You know that means that this is primarily a, f a command line tool. There are ports of the command line tools for Windows and Mac. I'm not at all familiar with the Mac tools and I won't mention them again, so if so you're on your own. The Windows port is managed by the GPG for Win project, and they do a good job. Uh, they also include some graphical Windows tools to go with it, however, I don't even install them. They're not very well done, they're not very stable, and they don't really even make it easier to use. So I just install the documentation and the command line tool. So let's have a look at symmetric encryption. This is the one that uses one key. And this is what traditional encryption looks like. So user one on the left, right here, has some sensitive data in its original form. This is called plain text. The user on the left wants to share that data with the user on the right, over here. He'll send it through Dropbox. It's been proven that Dropbox does not keep user data secure, so the user on the left is concerned that the Dropbox admins or a hacker that compromises at the Dropbox server, or maybe a government entity with an overreaching warrant, may acquire the data from the Dropbox servers. So he'll use a symmetric in encryption algorithm such as AES to encrypt his file before sending it to Dropbox. This encryption type requires a password. So he enters a password, encrypts the file, and puts it on the Dropbox folder. So now we have this encrypted data here that's called a ciphertext. So now it's on the Dropbox folder. He sees the file synchronize and it arrives on the unsecured Dropbox server and it's available to anyone who he shared it with. He'll email the URL and the password to his colleague on the right. Now that his colleague can download the encrypted file and decrypt it using the password from the email, he has the original file. Anyone who tried to intercept the file while it was on the Dropbox server can only see the garbled mess that was the encrypted data. Now there are a few problems with this. First, the user on the left must somehow exchange the password or the key with the user on the right. Sending it in an email is incredibly unsecure. Second, the password can only be can be used by anyone who has it. So if it gets in the wrong hands, the wrong people can decrypt it. If it's a weak password and someone can guess it, then the file is not secure. If the password is intercepted in the e password exchange, then the file is not secure. If the recipient writes down the password, the data is not secure. If the sender reuses the same password for all his operations, then the file is not secure. It quickly becomes clear that while AES is powerful encryption, the weak point in this whole endeavor is that the password or the password exchange or key exchange. Using an asymmetric key pair for the encryption both solves the problem of key exchange and also introduces some very sophisticated capabilities. Let's look at the simple operation of sharing sensitive data as we did in the last slide, but this time with an asymmetric key pair. The user on the left still wants to share a file over Dropbox, but this time he encrypts it using the recipient's public key. The plain text is encrypted into a ciphertext and shared over Dropbox just as before. The recipient gets the ciphertext and this time uses their private key to decrypt the message. Everything in this scenario is the same except for the keys in the key exchange. In an asymmetric key pair, the pair has two halves. One's called the public key and the other is called the private key. These two halves are mathematically linked to each other and they will forever operate together monogamously. Neither will work with a counterpart in any other key pair. When the user on the right generated a key pair, he put his public key on his website, emailed it to everyone in his address book, and added it to his email signature. There's no danger in doing this. He can give it to anybody. You, you give your public key to your worst enemy, and he can't do anything malicious with it. On the other hand, the private key should never be shared with anyone. It's called the private key, and it must be kept private. 
You don't even exchange it with somebody that you're exchanging data with. You keep it to yourself. So now that the user on the left has the public key for the recipient on the right, he can use it to encrypt the plain text. The resulting ciphertext can never be decrypted by anyone except the user on the right. This is because the decryption is done with a private key. And the user on the right is the only person in the world who has that private key because he owns the private key and has never shared it. This means that there's no sensitive exchange of a key involved. This completely removes the weakest part of sharing encrypted files. It also does some other good things. The user on the right can't just encrypt everything using the same password. Sorry, the user on the left can't encrypt everything using the same password. He must target the recipient specifically. The user on the right can't have doesn't have to remember so many encryption passwords that they're tempted to write them down. An interesting alternative is that if we reverse the keys, then we get digital signing instead of encryption. The recipient can verify the file came from the sender who claims it by verifying the signature using the public key of the sender. This can be used to prove the original sender because the public key of the claimed sender will be mathematically linked to the private key of the claimed sender. If the public key can be verified against the signed message, then only the person with the corresponding private key could have signed it. As long as we trust that the public key we're using belongs to the person we were told it belongs to, then we can trust the signature. I mentioned trust twice there. This is important, and we'll talk about it later. But trust and public keys go hand in hand when using PGP. So let's talk about the PGP key ring. GPG manages a virtual key ring. Here you store your public-private key pairs and also your colleagues public keys. This is a database that GPG maintains. Once you receive a public key from a colleague you'll put it into your key ring and only then can GPG use the public key in its operations. So managing your key ring is something that you'll do on a regular basis. Just a reminder it's not hard to remember which one you share and which one you don't, but I get asked this all the time. The private key is the one you keep to yourself. You can remember it by its name. So, some typical PGP tasks. These are all typical tasks that you'll perform with PGP, and we're going to perform all of them today. The one task we won't cover is a detailed protocol for building and maintaining a web of trust. We'll cover that in our key signing party, so look for that when we announce it. I just wanted to mention this before we start our walkthrough. One of the ways which we can share public keys for use with PGP is through public key servers. There are many out there and most of them synchronize with each other. I've listed some of the more popular ones on the right. They have a web interface and you can search them, but you can also consume them directly from the GPG command line. When you start building your web of trust, these are an important tool, but remember that anyone can generate a key with any name and email address that they want and they can upload them to these public servers. If you just search for Linus Torvalds you can see how many malicious people have uploaded fake keys to these servers. So be careful which keys you trust. Always verify them in person just as you would at a key signing party. And list keys. This is something you'll do constantly while performing other operations so it's prudent to start here. So from the command line you can enter the input shown on the left and you'll get the output seen on the right. I've been manipulating the key ring for this presentation so mine is a bit different, but that's okay. Yours will indicate that it created a trust database because this is your first time using it. So if I enter that command, it shows me nothing because there are no keys in there. Easy. So. We can't do anything without keys and a proper public key exchange, so we'll start by creating our own key pair. GPG generates a key pair for you when you use the gen key switch. I've shown some output on the right, but it's very much cut down. The operation actually involves a kind of questionnaire and walkthrough, but this gives you some idea. Let's go ahead and do that. And here we go. The first thing it asks is what type of key to use. We'll use RSA. Next it needs to know what key size you wish to use. The default is 2048 and that's a good size but I'm going to use 4096. 
Every bit that you add to the key size doubles its complexity and performance is still good enough that a 4096 bit key won't hinder me. So I'm going to use the largest key that I can. You can specify an expiration date for the key. Once it expires, it can no longer be used to encrypt, decrypt, or sign. For now, I'll set it to never expire to keep things simple. And yes, that is correct. Now it asks for a name for the key. I'm going to make one up for this demo. Then it asks for an email address for that user. And this technically doesn't need to be a real email address, but it's better if it is. And no comment. O for OK. Now it asks for a password. It's best if you don't just make up a password here. Get yourself a password database such as KeePass. That's the one I use. There are others, but I have good reasons to use KeePass. One of the reasons I use it is that any good password safe will have a password generation function in it. I can go to KeePass, generate a nice random password with lots of complexity, and it'll be composed of complete garbage. I won't have to think about what it's going to be or how I'm going, going to remember it. It won't be predictable. It will store it in its encrypted database, and I can keep track of it without having to remember what the password is. That's important because your encryption is truly only as strong as your password. For this presentation, I am going to use a simple short password just to keep it easy, and it'll be okay because I'm going to delete these keys when I'm done and never actually use them. So I'll say 123, and it tells me that this is a terrible password. I'd say do it anyway, and I enter it again. Now it prompts to perform some arbitrary operations to generate some entropy, which means chaos. It's not important to understand why, but it's, it's important to know that the program needs that. So I would normally wiggle my mouse around violently or drag the window around or perform other operations to make the computer, you know, think and do. And that adds complexity to the key. And now it's done. So let's return to our key ring. I have a key pair. Let's look at that for a moment. We see three lines here. This line says pub, which indicates that this is a public key. This line says UID, which indicates that these are the user identification credentials that I put in that key. And this line indicates that it's a sub key. We don't have to worry about that just yet. Uh, up here on the public key, it says 4096. That, of course, is the size of this key and it indicates an R, which means that it's an RSA type key. And here, this number, which coincidentally has only numeric digits in it, is a hexadecimal uh, called a short key or a short ID. Uh, there's a fingerprint on every key that's very long, and this is a short representation of that. So this is a unique identifier for this key. And here's the date that it was created. Here's the username and, of course, the corresponding email that I put in. Now, over here, this is called trust. Any key that you generate in uh, GPG is given ultimate trust. Now, we haven't talked about that yet, but we're going to cover it. It's important to know when we're talking about trust that you can come here to find it. Now we have a public and private key pair in our key ring, and it's very important to keep those safe. So the first rule is that we want to make a backup, right? Well, we can't really back up a key while it's in the database exactly. Of course, we can back up the entire database itself. They're just files on disk. And people do that. It's not a bad idea. But what we really want to do is back up specific keys for our use. Not just for backup, but this is also what we want to do when we need to distribute specific public keys. We want to export those keys from the database. So we're going to do that now. We'll export a private key to the to a file encrypted, and then we'll export the public key normally to a file. So let's examine this command line. It's kind of long, so I'll break it down a bit. For those who are looking at the slides, I indicate how this works down here, uh, but I'm going to orate it just for the video as we go. What we really have is a command line tool that's happy to accept input from standard in. So if I were to go like this, it prompts me for some typing. And then Control Z, which means end a file character. And it processed it. It didn't do quite 
anything useful, but it does. It does accept the keyboard input as its st from standard input as the data that it will run its operations on. It's also happy to send out its output to the standard out stream. That way, most operations read and write to these I/O streams and don't actually touch the disk. That's important when you don't want passwords, private keys, plain text, or otherwise very sensitive data going to disk. What goes to disk sometimes stays on disk, and that's a security risk. So PGP is, sorry, GPG is happily designed to let you pipe your data between programs through standard in and standard out via these standard operating system mechanisms. So when I export my private key, I don't really want it going to the hard disk. I want it to be encrypted and then go to the hard disk, but that's a separate GPG operation. So how do we combine these operations? If I enter the command line here in its simplest form, then its output goes to standard out. And it's garbage, of course. Uh, I've omitted some parameters here. This one and this one. We'll talk about that. Right now, if I do this again with the armor parameter, then I get something very different. When I enter this command line, it shows me a lot of garbage, and then I add the armor switch, and it means that it's going to format the output for us. First it shows me down here at the bottom uh, a nice little footer, and at the top it shows me a nice little header. And these indicate what type of content is in here. I can see that this is a private key. And it's important to know what kind of file you're looking at. If I look at this later, I want to know if it's a private key, a public key, if it's something I can distribute, or if it's something sensitive. It's always nice to know. So I prefer to armor everything if I can. It also gives us Base64 encoding and these nice little line breaks so that it's easy to read, easy to paste, easy to share. So for many operations this is much nicer. Another parameter we could have given it is anything that specifies the key that we're exporting. This could be the key name, the email address, or the short ID. Any of those will work. And that's the parameter you see here. The output for this operation went to standard out, so it comes to the screen instead of the hard disk. Now, if I want it to go to the hard disk, I'll want to encrypt it first. And I can do that by taking the export command line and adding a pipe character to the end. And that sends the output of this command as input to a second command. And in this case, it's going to be an, a symmetric encryption command. I'm going to specify the AES 256-bit algorithm. And then this will also go to standard output unless I give it an output parameter and give it a file name. And since this is a Linux, Linux application, they like to use .asc extensions for text files when working with GPG. Uh, but this isn't actually going to be a text file, even though I'm going to armor it. It really is an encrypted file. And so we're also going to put on a .gpg at the end. That way, when it gets decrypted, what it's going to do is take that original source file name, user1 private key .asc .gpg, and drop the .gpg, and the output file name will typically be user one private keyasc a text file. So by convention, we'll name it like this. We can also armor this. Uh, it doesn't make much difference in this particular instance, but because I'm going to show it to you, we'll go ahead and do that real quick. I'll take off this output parameter, and it's going to prompt me for a password. I'll enter it twice, and it sent the output to standard out so that we can see it. It's armored. 
And what I wanted to show you is that if you encounter an armored encrypted file, this is the footer that you're going to get, end PGP message. And of course, the corresponding header, begin PGP message. So if you see those, just to give you an idea what you're looking at. Now normally, put this back in here. And it's written to disk. Now normally at the end of the command for symmetric encryption I would specify an input file name. Since our input is coming from the standard in stream because of this pipe and that's being produced by this GPG command, we don't want to specify the input file name. We're just going to omit it and that will read from standard in. So it asked me for a password. It's important to note that this is not the password that we used for our private key and public our uh, our key pair. It's a different password that's just for this file name because we didn't use that key pair to encrypt it. This is symmetric encryption and it's an operation all by itself. So make up a new one for this and keep track of it. So now we can see that it's produced this .gpg file. And of course if we look at it, we can see that it's the output that we saw before and it's what we expect. So it's all encrypted and it's on disk. And it never touched the disk unencrypted, so that's great. Now we come to the easy part. Exporting our public key is a single operation with no encryption involved. We can issue a single command and just be done with it. As simple as it is, let's break it down even further to, as we go just to be thorough. Of course, that exports the public key. It sends it to standard out. We can add the armor parameter. And we get a formatted output as before. We've again omitted the key name because there's only one and it determines automatically that this is the one to use. As an experiment, let's enter the key identifier, but I'll give it some invalid input just to show you what it does. Easy peasy, right? You can correct it and again get the correct output. Great. Because it's armored and therefore composed of proper text, it can easily be redirected to a file name. But it's always safer to use the output parameter, such as like that. And we can see that the file is there. and contains a public key block. We're in good shape. Now you'll notice that I've gone out of my way to order the parameters in a certain way. Let's go back to that command line there. The GPG is pretty forgiving about the order really, but the input source file is usually a secondary parameter following the operation parameter, in this case export. Uh, so meaning symmetric, export, export secret keys, etc. And it's occasionally omitted. So now there are a few things that programmers have wired into their brains after a while. First, that command line switches usually come before I.O. parameters after a command. And second, that optional parameters come last in a list. So for these reasons, you'll find many examples on the internet formatted this way. Switches first, operation last. At this point we need to collect public keys from our colleagues. Our colleagues have gone through the same steps that we have. They've generated their own key pairs, backed them up, exported them 
exported their public keys, and they're ready to exchange data. To exchange data, we must first exchange public keys. So user2 has sent us their public key. We receive the public key as a file, probably armored. We verify it, then import it into our key ring. That sounds like a lot to do, doesn't it? Well, there are quite a few steps involved in importing a public key, but it's all very easy. So let's do that now. So I've received a file, and there it is, the public key for user2. And it's armored, and I can see here that it is actually a public key. So there we go. Now I need to verify the key before importing it so that I know I can trust it. To do that, I have to meet with the key owner in person at a key signing party or at work or over coffee, something like that, so that I can verify two things. First, the authenticity of the public key, and second, the authenticity of the person. That's right, because human-to-human -human confirmation is the only actual authentication supported by PGP. You would meet this person and actually ask them for two forms of ID or a birth certificate or anything you could convince them to show you. Uh, whatever it takes to satisfy you that they are who they say they are. Of course, you don't have to verify everybody. Asking your mom for ID is a surefire way to get, find yourself written out of the family estate. But we security where IT professionals understand that social engineering is often the easiest way to circumvent cybersecurity. I assume that anyone who's interested in using PGP level encryption either already knows this or is paranoid enough to take my word for it. Verifying a person may not require such an interrogation though. If you were to exchange keys with your best friend and you trust them and you know their voice, you may be satisfied to just verify their key over the phone rather than face to face. But you can still, there's still an issue and a human interaction there. Uh, you know that you're not dealing with a robot. You know that a hacker isn't faking their voice. Uh, so you would never want to do this email to email, for example, because you just can't be sure that that email came from the person that it says it came from. That would defeat the social aspect of this verification without electronic interference. So the second part, verifying the key, is done by verifying the key's fingerprint. And here's how. First, both parties need to determine what the fingerprint is on their end. The owner will read it off to the verifier, and if the numbers match, then the key is the one that the owner sent to you. If you trust the key and you trust the owner, then you can proceed to import the key. So to determine the key fingerprint, we use this command. With fingerprint. And then we need to specify the file name. And it shows me the big long fingerprint. This is a hexadecimal series, a series of hexadecimal numbers, so it's easy to rattle off. And if you're talking to the, if the verifier is talking to the owner, either one of them can rattle it off. And as long as, uh, well, the owner should rattle it off. The verifier should verify it. And uh, if they match, then the verifier can say, "Yes, I received the file that the owner sent, and we are in agreement that this file has integrity, and it's the one that I can import." So that file is then verified. Now, uh, this command shows us the whole fingerprint. And once that's verified, I, as I mentioned before, this, the last tail end of it, is the short ID. And you can refer to it by that short ID from now on. And it's also shown up here. Just something to note. So now we can import the public key. and it's been imported. And there it is. We see the entire key imported here in our key ring, right next to ours, which is up here. But we know that this is the key that we entered, but we don't know that it's, but it's not trusted. So now that we have it imported, the trust is unknown by default. If I try to perform any operations with this key, it won't allow me to because it's not a trusted key. It says, okay, we've stored it, it's in your key ring, we have it, we'll keep it, but because we don't trust it, we're not going to allow you to do anything with it because that's dangerous. So this is good. So the next thing that we need to do is make this key usable, right? It's been verified, so we should be able to use it safely. We just need to convince it. So we have to mark it as trusted. To do that, we issue the key 
And now that we have two keys, we have to specify which one we want it to do. We'll specify the user2 key. And it shows it to us here. But now I have a whole bunch of new commands because, as you'll note, uh, I now have a GPG prompt instead of the regular command prompt. Uh, first thing I'm going to do, well, real quick, you can see the question mark will show you some of these commands, so that's useful to know. But the first thing I'm going to do is sign this key, and I'll just issue the command sign. And it asks me if I'm sure. It shows me that information again, but I've verified all of that. Just make sure that you're looking at the right key. And it'll tell me that it needs my password to verify which key I'm using, that I'm authorized to use that key. And so I give it my super awful password that I gave it in the beginning. Great. And it's done. So I've just used my key to mark it as a key that's been verified according to me. Now that I've used my key to sign it, I should export it and send the signed key back to the owner so that he can import it back into his key ring. This will merge my signature with any other signatures he has on his public key. Now the next time the owner dist distributes his public key, it will have more signatures on it and it will be more trustworthy than ever before. This is not a popularity contest. It's not that you're more trustworthy because you have more signatures. You're more likely to be trustworthy with many signatures because one of them is more likely to be trusted by the recipient which, with which you're exchanging keys. So if the recipient sees my signature on, their sender's, on, on the sender's key, they may decide to trust him by proxy. Socially, this is because they know and trust me, but cryptographically, it's because they have verified and imported my public key, which was used to sign the public key that they're currently importing if that makes any sense. So I still can't use this key though because I haven't marked it as trusted. So I'm going to issue the trust command and it's going to ask me how much I trust it. I've, I've verified this key. I know who sent it. I trust them. I'm going to mark it with absolute trust. You don't have to mark it with absolute trust. You can use one of the other trust levels. But with ultimate trust, you'll be able to perform any operation against this key. So now that I'm done with that, I can quit. Save changes, yes. And I'm back to my normal command prompt. And I can see here now that ultimate trust has been granted to that key. So the key's been imported, signed, and trusted in the key ring, and the process is now complete. I've created a very sensitive file. So I have a plain text file that I can encrypt. I'll encrypt it using user2's key so that only user2 can read the file. I have to tell it using the recipient switch which user will be able to decrypt the file. That's the public key that's going to be used during the encryption. And there's no visible output because we set it to a file instead. and it contains garbage as I expect it to. That's the encrypted content of my plain text. Now I mentioned this was a one-way operation so what would happen if I tried to decrypt this ciphertext? It tells me that I don't have a secret key for user 2 and I don't. I only have the public key. It was encrypted with the public key for user 2 and it can only be decrypted with the private key for user 2 and I don't have it. Since only user 2 has it, only user 2 can decrypt it no matter who created it. Now suppose that I've exchanged public keys with one of my colleagues and they've used my public key to encrypt a file. They've sent that file to me and I want to decrypt it with my private key. And its contents are encrypted. So let's decrypt it. And so you can see some interesting information here about who encrypted it and who decrypted it. And right here is the message. 
I would normally add the output parameter to dump it to a file as shown in the slide. By reversing the keys, PGP can digitally sign your data. That means two things. First, it means that you can prove who signed the file. If you have the public key of the sender, you can prove that the original sender has the corresponding key. Second, you can prove that the file they sent is intact. The data you received is the same data that they sent and nothing has altered it along the way. There are three ways to sign your data, and I'll cover each one. First, we'll do a normal signing. We'll sign the same plain text that we've been working with. A normally signed file will be garbled. If the file is not verified, it also cannot be read. This might be suitable for exchanging sensitive direct messages such as email, but probably not so much when posting in a news group where millions of people will read it, but most aren't interested in verifying the signature, or maybe the verification is not as important as the message itself is. For situations like that, a clear signed message is more appropriate. Such a message is armored, and also contains the original message embedded between its headers. You see that the original message is readable with or without verification. It's displayed right here. However, you also see that the message itself is only human readable. The file no longer reflects that original file exactly. This is fine for human readable messages such as email, but what if we had tried to sign a database file or a spreadsheet? Sure, we can verify the original sender, but we can't actually use the file. We have actually corrupted the original data with this PGP information here and here. When signing data which requires integrity, the third option can be used. This is the detached signature. It's a standalone file that can be distributed alongside the original file, leaving the original file intact. Given both files, GPG can use the detached signature file to verify both the origin and integrity of the data file. So you can see the signature file was created here, and we would send that along with the original data file. And here's what the signature file looks like. Note the signature header and footer. Now that we have some signatures, let's see how a recipient would verify the source and integrity of the data. for a normal signature file. We would do it like this. And it tells us that we have a good signature and it tells us from whom. In other words, which key was used. Uh, this is a little bit strange because I'm doing the signing and the verifying. So they're both me in this case. It's kind of hard to do it otherwise with somebody else's key. So. And it's the same thing for a clear sign file. There you go. And it's a little bit different for a detached signature. We have to specify two files. 
and they need to be in order. First you specify the signature file and then you specify the data file and the output is familiar there. And that's all there is to it. That just about wraps it up for PGP but I wanted to take a moment to practice what I preach. I stated earlier that you should use proper passwords and proper password management to make proper pass passwords practical. I said it, I mean it, and I live it, so I'm going to show you how you can do it too. First, get yourself a cheap USB dongle, something around 2 gigabytes is plenty. That's what I use. The more ostentatious it is, the better, because you never ever want to leave this USB device plugged into a computer when you get up and leave. If you accidentally leave your password safe unlocked, anyone can, with access to that computer will have access to every single password you've ever used. And I don't have to tell you that that's bad. So, I'm going to put up a picture of the one that I use. It was free. It's easy to see it flapping around on the side of a laptop. Now, download, download KeePass or a comparable password safe and put it on the USB drive. It needs to be able to run without installation so that you can access your passwords on any machine you may encounter. You don't want to use a program that will sync passwords. Just ask J-Law. You you want to keep them on the USB dongle instead. You don't want those going up up into the cloud. If hackers can get your password database, if they can't get your password database, they can't decrypt it. So just keep it with yourself. There are two versions of KeePass, version 1 and version 2. Either one is fine, but I've been using it for a while and so in this video I'm using the old version 1 because that's what I have on this drive. With the KeePass downloaded and unzipped to a folder on the USB device as you see here, go ahead and run it. It'll open an existing database path, uh, password database if it finds one, but you don't have one yet, so it opens to an empty screen like this. We click the New button to create a new password database. The password database is encrypted with a password, a master password, so it prompts you for one now. You can also use two-factor authentication, so let's talk about that for a moment. Two-factor authentication requires proof of your identity from two out of three categories. Those three categories are something you have, something you are, and something you know. The something you know is easy. That's your password. Since that knowledge can be shared, a second category can greatly improve the security of an authentication process. Something you are can fall into two basic categories. They are fingerprint scans and facial recognition. Of course, other forms may exist, but these are simple and present in uh, simple common machines such as laptops and phones. There are also issues with these factors because something you are has the potential to change. Fingerprints can scar and faces can be disfigured. A coworker of mine has, an, has a smart scale at home which recognizes the user by weight. He stopped exercising for a while and stopped weighing himself and when he got back into his groove and got back on the scale he'd gained enough weight that the scale didn't know who he was. It's kind of funny kind of sad, but all true. Something you have is more practical. It can be a USB device. A hacker who gets your Yahoo password can't get into your Gmail account with the same password if it also requires your phone because they don't have possession of the something you have factor. While two-factor authentication may be good, the something you have factor sort of qualifies already because we're carrying around this USB dongle. So any access to passwords in our password safe actually requires something we have and something we know, which our USB dongle, which which is our USB dongle and our password. This is pretty secure, so I'll just go with a master password on my password safe. So in the master password prompt, we'll just use a master password. And remember that this is the weakest part of any password or authentication system you use from now on because it grants access to all your other passwords. Therefore, make it a good, strong, secure password. We all know the rules, but I'll reiterate them here. No people names, no lingual phrases. If you speak English, that means no English phrases. No combinations of capitals, sorry, use combinations of capitals, lowercase numbers, and punctuation. Don't use numbers which are related to you. Never reuse a password. Never simply increment the numbers in your password when changing them, just tacking on a one and then a two and then a three at the end. Uh, using no numbers that are related to you, let's go into that. That means no birthdays, no birth years, no graduation dates, no social security numbers, no pins that you use in other systems. 
Okay, just none of those. Now I know that we all violate these rules all the time, and that's because there are just too many passwords for us to remember, and it's the only way to get on with our lives. But now that you're setting up a password safe, all that nonsense is behind you. I've been doing this for a while, and I don't have trouble with this at all. So, to make a good strong password, try picking a favorite quote, a piece of advice you heard, or a song lyric, and capture the first character of each word. Capitalize the letters that exist in your name, and lowercase the rest of them, or, you know, just come up with something like that. Many of us have heard that we should convert typical letters to their punctuational or numeric doppelgangers, such that S becomes a dollar sign, O becomes a zero, E becomes a three, etc. Uh, this is not as important in password construction as people have been led to believe. Because we humans always make the same translations between the same characters, it's easy to predict and it's not that, it doesn't contribute that much to the complexity or the entropy of your password. So don't waste a lot of time uh, try, trying to do this to make your password complex just to accommodate this recommendation. It's better to make the password longer or, or add punctuation symbols in random places. So I'll create one that's, that says the sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there will be sun. Which translates to T-S-W-C-O-T. And at the end of that sentence I'll put an exclamation point. B-Y-B-D-T-T-T-B-S. And at the end of that sentence I'll put a period. And I have just gone and capitalized every other letter for no reason at all. And I'm creating the password at 1107, so I'll just tack on a 07 at the end. Now when I press enter, it's going to prompt me to repeat it, so here I go. Yay! Okay, now that I'm in, I'll right click on the general folder, and I'll add group, and I'll name it PGP. I'll click on that node and right click to add a new entry. In this dialog box I can enter all the info I need to accommodate a login in a website or service. The only things I need for a PGP entry are the title and the password, but to make it easily searchable I'll put, it, put in all the PGP key info. In the notes here, I put in uh, the email address, and the creation date, and the expiration date. So that's all I really need in here. The password is already populated for me. So in this password field, I can click the ellipse and it'll show me what that password is. And I could copy it out of here, or once it's created, it will show up here and I can double click on the password field and it will put it temporarily on my clipboard. Mind you that that can be captured by clipboard management programs, such as the ones that I use, but it's still handy to have. If I don't like this password for some reason, uh, maybe it just looks funny or it or it's too long or doesn't contain the, the characters that are um, required for the password complexity requirements for the website that I'm using. This doesn't apply to PHP, but for whatever reason, if I don't like that password, I can come into the password generator and I can change the parameters that it uses, the constraints that it'll use for generating passwords, such as maybe I just want it to be shorter and I'll put in a maximum size of 10. And then I can just click generate here and it'll give me a new one. I can do it over and over, and it, it shows me the complexity here and the number of bits there. If I were to add special characters, I would go from approximately 60 bits to 63. This doesn't add a lot of complexity. I am much better off just taking that out and making it 20. And then I go up to 105 bits. So this is interesting to play with, but any random password is better than a human constructed password anyway. So you know, all of this is just, uh, it's all pretty good. 
If I click accept, then it populates the fields out here with the one that was just generated using the constraints I specified, and I can click OK and that entry will be committed. It's not saved to the disk yet though. I could lose this if I discarded it. I need to click the save button. Now I have I have my actual database over here that I removed temporarily. And I'll just save that to a file. Now the next time I start this, I'll uh, start this key pass, it's going to try to reopen that same file. And it did. So here you have it. Carry this dongle with you everywhere you go, just like your wallet, your ID, your keys, and make it a part of your life. And you will never have trouble with password complexity or forgotten passwords or reusing passwords ever again. And you can put your PGP passwords in here and have strong PGP passwords. Because again, the easiest way to thwart any kind of encryption is to get your hands on a weak password. So don't use weak passwords, use a key safe. Others, other key safes that I've heard of, of course, are LastPass and NPass and 1Password. There are reasons that I chose KeyPass. For, for starters, as I mentioned, you don't have to install it. It can just sit on this USB drive and run directly. Second, it's open source. I can build it myself, and I know that the code that's in there isn't malicious, or somebody would have caught it. Or at least there's a better chance of it. Uh, it doesn't sync to the cloud. I don't want my passwords out there for enthusiasts or experts to try and hack on. I don't want it. There's no reason for them to even have it. The only con the only reason to do it is for convenience so that I can get to it from other machines. Well, key loggers on other machines can really cause you some havoc with that too. It's better to just have this program in place. Uh, LastPass, which lives in the cloud almost entirely, people will tell you about the nice features that it has and they are impressive, but at the end of the day, LastPass has been hacked at least twice that I know of. And if you have any password hacked, the last one you want hacked is the one to your password safe. That, that hacks all your passwords, so just don't do it. If you find another piece of software that you like, fine, but be careful about your selection. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope you learned something. If you liked what you saw, be sure and check out our other videos or visit us in person at our meetings if you're in the area. Visit our website for more information.